And hello and welcome everyone to a very special video brought to you by the Kate Joel channel in conjunction with my good pal and co-host Matt from Fortress of Solitude. How are you going, Joe? Oh, I'm doing all right, Matt. I'm doing especially all right because today we're going to be talking about Doomsday Clock. It's the next big hot event coming out this week. Well, not this week as we record this, but the coming week. We actually tried to work in advance on this one. I'm calling this video a brief guide too. We used to do these back in another life on another channel, but I thought it was only right we resurrect this series because truth be told, there's a lot to know about DC's next mega event, Doomsday Clock. There is, and it, it makes sense that we would do something for this because it's it's such a big event. It's not your usual summer event. No, 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 no. They are... They're dropping it right here this month uh, in November. It's, it's more like a winter event, but you know, they've been building up to this for a long time, and I've essentially put out here a little timeline of important events for people who may not have been reading or may not have been paying attention, so they can kind of get caught up, kind of get our thoughts, and get ready for when the comic itself drops on uh, midnight, which I think is pretty clever that because this story involves so much of the Watchmen and the nuclear doomsday clock, they're dropping this comic at midnight on Tuesday. It makes sense. They should they should have dropped it at eleven fifty five. I think they're doing it like eleven fifty seven. It actually goes on sale. Yeah, I, that's probably right because the 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 issue I ordered is is called the eleven fifty seven p.m. variant. Ah, nice, nice. But uh, so yeah, let's let's start right at the beginning. And the fact is, uh, Doomsday Clock actually goes back a little further than even DC Rebirth. It goes back all the way to the end of the storyline, Dark Side War, which went on for a long time. We didn't really know where it was going, but the big takeaway finale of it was. Owlman of the Crime Syndicate had managed to take control of Metron of the New Gods Mobius throne, and because of that, he was given all the knowledge in the universe, and being a villain, he of course wanted to use it to dastardly ends. He wanted to see the creation of the universe. Yeah, yeah, he he had the uh, the, the the Wikipedia admin mm. admin codes. You could you could search everything, rewrite history if he wanted to, everything and just drunk on his own sense of power. Yeah, he, he tried to do that, and he, he found something pretty interesting. He got freaking killed for it by a mysterious blue light, and get used to hearing mysterious blue light, because we're going <laughs> to mention it a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we are. In, in fact, kind of the under uh, the overarching theme of Dark Side War was that no normal everyday being is meant to see the beginning of time, which is kind of something that happens a lot and is echoed throughout DC lore. In fact, they even did a Justice League, the animated yep. series episode about that, where it's like, oh, no one is meant to see the creation of the universe because it'll mess with your head. Uh, yeah, there, the, the blue hand. The blue hand, which, oh, we will talk about the blue hand. Don't <laughs> you worry. We've got a whole thing on that. Uh, next in the timeline of importance, we move on to the events of DC Universe Rebirth number one. This was that big 80 page giant they did to kick off their new universe and a bunch of storylines that ran through all the books. Uh, another important player is killed in the opening pages of this, and that is Pandora, who is a holdover from the New 52. We all thought she was going to be really important. She was cosmically in tuned. It, then she never turned out to be important. Yeah, she just kind of disappeared, and the, the, this is probably the most important thing she's done since those yeah. first couple of issues of the New 52. Yeah, yeah, she's running around like a crazy person at the beginning of this, like, oh, I know, I know the secret, and then boom, blue light, she's dead. Yeah, she dies. It's similar to to uh, another comic character who I imagine we'll be talking about a little later on. Yes, yes, these are very reminiscent deaths. Uh, if, if you know your comic mm. lore and if you read some stuff outside your regular DC comics. The other big important thing about DC Universe Rebirth was that it marked the return of beloved fan favorite character Wally West, the original Kid Flash, and uh, later just the Flash Flash for a whole generation of people, myself included. Yeah, the, this was like one of the, the the big surprise everyone was talking about oh, yeah. um, in, in a book full of surprises. But yeah, everyone was really happy that Wally was back. I was happy he's back. He, he's the Flash I knew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wally makes a very strong point of saying that everything is different 
than how he remembers the DC universe as we know it. Something is wrong with it, and it's not just because it rebooted and became the new 52. No, this has always been the same DC universe that we've always known from the very beginning, or at least since we've known since the last couple crises. The world is different, and the reason the new 52 was grim and gritty and everyone was miserable and everyone had fallen out of love and moved apart is supposedly because, and Wally tells us this, that 10 years are missing from the timeline. Some powerful, unseen being just stepped on down and stole 10 years from our heroes. Yeah, they, they stole the 10 years from when Barry Allen went back and tried to uh, save his mother from the reverse flash during Flashpoint. Yes, and it's having some crazy, crazy ripple effects. Now, we will eventually find out in the pages of Titans, if you read that, Wally comes face to face with an old Flash villain from the future called Abracadabra, who we discover in a big, like, convoluted revenge plot against the Flash he hated so much, he more or less kicked him out of time and then used his magic powers to make all of his friends and everyone around him forget until they get touched by Wally. What's interesting about this is that in the final battle with Abracadabra, Omen, the Titan psychic, reads Kadabra's mind and finds out that he's actually working for some other nefarious force, but she can only glean one word from his mind, and that word is Manhattan. Yeah, and because these people don't know what that word means, mm. we do as readers, but because they don't know, they end up going and setting up shop in New York, in Manhattan, because that's where they think it's 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 a reference to, but it's, yep. it's not. It's not. Again, we know, that's what's so beautiful about this story. We as the reader know stuff. We know they're referencing, you know, Alan Moore's Watchmen, but to them, they have no frame of reference for it. It's crazy no. that they can have something that means two things. Yeah. Now, the next piece of the timeline, uh, this also started in DC Universe Rebirth, but it takes us through our next event called The Button, and that is Batman uh, in the Batcave, the same flash of lightning that brought Wally into the cave, also left something else behind, and that is a very familiar looking button to those who read Watchmen. It's the comedian's button that was just lodged in Batman's cave wall. Yeah, just came in with Wally somehow. We don't exactly know what the deal is with it. And even through the button, we don't really know what's going on, but we know it's imbued with some type of energy. Strange otherworldly energy, which again, that's also some words we're going to be saying a lot. Strange otherworldly energy. <laughs> uh, the button would end up reacting to speed force energy that was brought in by Eobard Thawne the reverse flash they kind of like you know co-mingled together and there was this big crazy explosion and thon was like well if i can't beat my enemies here then i'm going to travel to the beginning of time and see the creation of the universe doesn't go well for him no he gets like his face melted <laughs> He got better, though, because he's the reverse Flash, and he always gets better. But yeah, he, he got owned pretty hard. Yeah, he, he really did. And uh, the story also brought back another fan-favorite mm. speedster in that of Jay Garrick. Yes, yes it did, because our heroes decide to chase after the button by traveling through hypertime, which is an old, beloved DC concept that they have not used in many years. And it's one of my favorite... Uh, like descriptors and favorite devices that they created to describe continuity and why things from like 10 years ago in comics aren't like they were five years ago and that is like oh time flows in a river and there's you know tributaries and things break off and you know sometimes you'll remember a friend you haven't thought about in years but it's all the same people mm -hmm. yep and in traveling through time, they see a bunch of events that we had believed had been erased by the events of the New 52, only nope, they haven't been erased, they still exist in hypertime. Yeah, yeah, they're still technically canon. Still most definitely technically canon. Uh, one place that they end up stumbling upon is probably the last place you would think they would stumble, and that is the Flashpoint universe, the universe that was created uh, right before the New 52 when Barry Allen had tried to go back in time and save his own mother from the reverse Flash. What is interesting about this is that as far as our heroes were concerned, at this point, you could only travel to one of the different 52 Earths that exist in the multiverse. The Flashpoint universe doesn't exist, and that's my laundry going off so you know that's important to the story uh see we're getting too close to it matt we're going to unravel the secrets and dr manhattan doesn't like that so he made my dryer go off 
But yeah, uh, <laughs> the thing about the Flashpoint universe, as I was saying before I was rudely interrupted, it's not one of the 52 Earths. It's a timeline. A dead timeline, no less, that they mm -hmm. should not be able to access right now, but some crazy powerful force brought them there. Yeah, it just allows them a glimpse before that same force destroys that universe. Yes, and it's an amazing moment. Batman actually comes face to face with his father, Thomas Wayne, who in that world is a darker, gritty, more murderous Batman. And they have this real, like, kind of, you know, sweet, touching moment for a moment before the universe is destroyed. Yeah, yeah, it was a really great moment where his dad basically tells him to not be Batman anymore. Yeah, and then they don't really do anything with it in the Tom King Yeah, book, but hey. <laughs> hey, maybe they'll do something with it in Doomsday Clock. Maybe, maybe. maybe. Maybe they'll do something with it there, who knows. Now, the fact that Bruce came face to face with his father is pretty damn interesting too, because uh, that leads us into our next big important piece of the timeline for Doomsday Clock, and that is the actions of one Mr. Oz, who Jeff Johns had actually been planting the seeds of him even before DC Rebirth, you were telling me. Yep, his first appearance was in the New 52 Superman, I think issue 34? Right. It was Je Jeff Johns, I think the issue just before Jeff Johns uh, did his run on it, they sort of teased this, this shadowy, cloaked, in green figure with a staff right who had a major boner on for superman and yet would occasionally do very non-villainous things in fact it mm -hmm. seemed very much like he was trying to protect him by kidnapping important individuals that might want to harm superman and his new family like doomsday like uh mr mixelplek and uh, he even kidnapped a big evil multiversal superman that uh clark and the justice league of the multiverse had to get together and stop what was his name again like prophecy or uh something yeah, something like that. He had a weird one-word name. And now, Prophecy was interesting is that he was an evil multiversal Superman analog who was stealing the powers of other Superman from the multiverse. And the idea is, is that he needed the power. He needed to be strong to fight what was coming. And again, we never found out what was coming, but we have some theories. Yeah, we, we've got some theories. That are big and blue and don't like pants. <laughs> That's the theory. Another person that Mr. Oz kidnapped was Tim Drake out of the pages of Detective Comics right when he was about to seemingly die. He kidnapped him and saved his life. Um, We, we, we were talking about this not too long ago, how maybe this Tim had something similar happen to him with Superman yeah. where he might have might have been reborn as his pre-Flashpoint era yes. uh, Tim. Yes, because when this Tim is asked to recount his origin story to Mr. Oz, he tells a completely different origin story than the one we came to know in the New 52, which, hey, I'm fine with old Tim Drake's origin was way better anyway. <laughs> yep, I agree. <laughs> but this led to an interesting theory where that is, oh, did they actually kill New 52 Tim? And now we have this multiversal version of him, this, you know, lost to time, hyper time version of him. Is yep. that going to be a twist in Doomsday Clock? I mean, Ooh, yeah, it, never know. I mean, if it is a twist, you all owe us a Coke. I'm just saying that right now because we <laughs> thought of it. Uh, eventually, we discovered that Mr. Oz is none other than Jor-El, Superman's Kryptonian father, who was saved from Krypton's destruction at the last second by, you guessed it, a mysterious blue light. <laughs> yes, a mysterious blue light that, that tortured him, but not in like any physical way, in more of a mental way. Yes, showing him the evils and horrors of mankind so he would lose all faith in the planet that he sent his son to live on and protect yeah going so far as to even drop him on earth and drop him into like the worst place you could imagine on earth which is like a nondescript african warlord country yeah. sort of thing yeah like you know basically just every you know horrible war crime atrocity you can think of befalling otherwise completely innocent people uh, yeah. What is funny, though, is that while well, Jorel is saved by this blue light thing, and he's kind of made a servant of this blue light, he's also a prisoner of the blue light as well, because the Mr. Oz's base of operation, this weird tower where he's taking all these important characters and holding them hostage, this is a place that we discovered just recently in Action Comics exists outside of hypertime. 
yeah in some weird other dimension where nothing can that's in that prison could get out and go and i guess hurt superman which is why they were all there yeah and it's it's interesting too is that you know we mentioned tim drake tim drake's not the only tim drake there there's also an evil batman of tomorrow future tim drake from the titans of tomorrow storyline again much like flashpoint a dark alternate future that doesn't exist or shouldn't exist anymore yeah, and again, we don't know why that Tim was there. No, we don't. We're still kind of learning a lot about him right now, but the choices of who gets picked up and who gets put in this hyper-time prison are very interesting. They are. They're very... They're, there's no real rhyme or reason between There's some that are, there's some that aren't. Yeah, now the future uh, Tim Drake as well kind of says a bunch of stuff that sounds very similar to what Wally had been telling us, and that is that, oh... The time in this place, it's been doctored, it's been changed. No one remembers my best friend, Connor Kent. What's up with that? Yeah, and yeah, no one does. And it might it might turn out to be a situation like how the pre-flash one, Wally, when he came over, he does exist, but he hasn't touched any of these people yet or been interacting with them yet. Mm -hmm. So they don't know who he is. Again, some very important people and some very important players have been messed with in this grand scheme of doctoring time, and you have to wonder if Doomsday Clock will explain why these particular individuals were singled out. Definitely, definitely. Uh, now, you too, because you read the Green Lantern books and I haven't, even the Green Lantern books mention about time and the universe being doctored by some unseen force. Oh, they've been doing everything in a, a couple of issues ago in Hell Jordan and the Green Lantern Club. Don't remember which issue number, but they try and restart hope in the universe with Saint Walker and the Blue Lanterns. And again, an unseen blue force stops them and destroys all the Blue Lanterns. Oh, shit. So hope is literally dead in the universe. Yeah, yeah. Exa and it, again, it goes, that fits in well with what we saw at the end of the Oz effect. Where, where hope was disappearing from Earth and everything. Yeah, that this evil blue force, who might not be Dr. Manhattan, but is totally Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, and again, the Guardians knew, know something's up with the universe, something's been, been messed with, and they don't know what it is exactly. We also saw a certain individual show up in the pages of Red Hood and the Outlaws who spoke in sentence fragments, had a messed up face, and a bunch of, like, string theory newspaper boards who reminded us of a very particular Rorschach. <laughs> so, again, all the pieces are coming together in interesting ways, and with that, we're basically the stage is set now for Doomsday Clock, whatever that might be. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to find out how they bridge these two universes together. Yeah, can we, and we, I mean, we got to give credit, too, to all the writers of all these books for really putting the work in to drop the breadcrumb trail and to make reference to Doomsday Clock, but also to not distract from the stories they have been telling. Oh, I can't imagine it would have been easy. They've probably had boards and boards of it over in the DC offices. They, okay, oh, yeah. there's going to be reference here, reference here, a big name drop here. And I mean, even if Doomsday Clock is a total fumble and a total dot, I mean, I sincerely doubt it will be. It's really goddamn impressive that they had, like, over a year of storytelling, like, 30-plus issues of most of these books, all leading to this one point in one way or another. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely a... a, a good achievement to have mm -hmm. all roads lead to doomsday clock and you can bet once the first issue drops this coming wednesday uh we will be here both matt and myself to tell you all about it to tell you how we feel and uh yeah i i cannot wait for it uh down in the comment section below be sure to tell us uh what you're most looking forward to about doomsday clock what's what's your crazy pie in the sky tinfoil theory for what you think it all <laughs> means and where we're going with this <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's just about it. We hope you enjoyed this brief explanation, this, you know, quick primer on Doomsday Clock. And if you like it and the views are good and the response is good, tell us what other stories coming up would you kind of like to hear or see me and Matt do little catch-ups on for you? Because we enjoy doing these, and I think we should do these more often. I definitely do. I know there's definitely going to be some because I know people have asked me to do some. Yeah, most certainly. So yeah, with that, everyone, I will bring the video to a close. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll be back again very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.